For our meditation of the Word of God, please turn with me to John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. And the Word of God says, He came to His own, and His own people did not receive Him. But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. May the Lord bless the reading and meditation of His Word. Last time, my dear brethren, we saw in verses 11 and 12 the rejection of Christ by the Jews. God's covenant people of old would not have the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Verse 11 clearly tells us he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. And that is a very sad story. One of the saddest verses in the scriptures actually. But we also saw the glorious blessing of the inclusion of the Gentiles in God's redemptive purpose. Christ and salvation is open to all who will receive him. Take note of the language of verse 12. But as many as received him. Meaning to say there are remnants who really wait for the coming Messiah. Not many, not the majority. But there are God's people whom he has chosen even before the foundation of the world. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who, who believe in his name. And if you could remember, I quoted Leon Morris last Sunday. And he said, the end of the story is not the tragedy of rejection but the grace of acceptance, or one might say, the tragedy of rejection and the triumph of reception. But then this, this morning, my dear friends, there is another glorious truth set forth in this passage. Yes, the Jews have rejected their Messiah and have abandoned the right to be called the children of God. But to those who receive Christ, they receive the amazing blessing of adoption. The Apostle John says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And the Greek word for right is exousia. It means or it refers to the legal right or authority. And you know what, my dear friends, John often refers to Jesus as the Son of God. Say, for instance, verse 34 of the first chapter, it says here, John 1, 34, I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. And of course, the most popular verse of the entire Bible, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And John chapter 20, verse 30 to 31. This is the purpose of John, the Apostle John, in writing his gospel. John 20, 30 to 31. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So we have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing, you may have life in His name. And going back to our passage today, my dear friends, in verse 12, He is saying that those who receive the Lord Jesus Christ, His Father has become their Father. We who receive the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, has become our Father. We have become heirs with Christ. Why do I say so? The language of Romans 8, 
16 and 17 is very clear. We have become heirs with Christ. Please turn there. Romans 8, 16 to 17, it says here, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, what's the consequence? Heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. And let's pause for a moment here, my dear brethren. Are you amazed that the creator of the universe would raise us up to such infinite heights? We are co-heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. We, who are we, by the way? Who are we that God would play such honor as to adopt us as his own dear children? We have been given the right to become children of God. And that is the focus of our meditation today. He would play such love upon us. How amazing that is, my dear brethren. And let us consider this morning the grace of adoption. And there are three parts of our meditation today. First, Receiving Christ. What does it mean? What does it mean to receive Christ? Second, hindrance to receiving Christ. And third, the consequence of receiving Christ or the result of receiving Christ. Let us commit these things to God in prayer once again. Let us pray. Oh dear Lord, we are mindful of your frank declaration that without you we can do nothing may the holy spirit accompany the preaching of the gospel today with so much power so that sinners will be brought to the feet of jesus christ we know that we need more than words the most that we could do is to bring word to people but the fruit of the word that we proclaim comes from you alone. So we pray and we plead that you will really accompany your gospel proclamation with the Spirit's power today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Receiving Christ. What does it mean, my dear friends? What does receiving Christ mean? Now we have to define this clearly. Because in our generation today, easy believism is very rampant. People say, are you lonely in your life? Accept Jesus Christ. He's going to make you happy. Don't you have meaning in your life? You don't have any meaning about your life at all? Receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Accept Him as your Lord and Savior. And your life will be meaningful. That's what health and wealth preachers proclaim well of course this is absolutely true that jesus christ is the ultimate source of our happiness in fact the only source of true happiness and it is also true that jesus christ alone gives meaning to our lives but when we present the lord jesus christ that way we present him as someone who only cater to our sentimental gushy feeling gushy sentimental feeling we have to define this clearly my dear friends what does receiving christ mean well first of all it means receiving christ according to his claims and declarations According to what is being revealed or the things about the Lord Jesus Christ that are being revealed in the initial verses of the Gospel of John. What are they, my dear friends? That Jesus Christ is eternal. We have to accept it. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. We have to accept that Jesus Christ is a person distinct from the Father. The Word was with God. So here is the objective revelation about the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to accept that Jesus Christ is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ is both God and man. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John would later say in verse 14, we also have to accept that Jesus Christ is creator. 
All things came into being through him. And we have to accept that Jesus Christ is the source of all spiritual life. In him was life. That's what receiving the Lord Jesus Christ means. But then secondly, my dear friends, receiving Christ means believing in him as the only remedy to our problem of sin, guilt, and condemnation before God. And this necessitates humility on our part to accept that we have a problem. Now, what is our problem? We have a twofold problem of bad record and bad heart. We violated the law of God. We violated God's moral law. And we keep on violating God's moral law. And Romans chapter 6 verse 23 clearly tells us that the wages of sin is death. We are liars. We are idolaters. We are natively adulterers. We do not honor. We have not honored our parents as we ought to. We are Sabbath breakers, Sabbath violators. And God's demand is that we obey His law perfectly. Because God is perfect. Therefore, we must be perfect. And that renders all of us as having a righteousness that is not acceptable in the sight of God. All of our self-righteousnesses are just filthy rags in the sight of God. And then it says that the payment, the wages of sin is death. Blood. Blood must be offered in order for our sins to be atoned for. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Now we have to accept that Jesus Christ alone, as our representative, He is God, but He became man without ceasing to be God so that He would be qualified to be our representative. He obeyed the law of God perfectly and he shed his blood on the cross of Calvary as a perfect sacrifice for sin. There is this atonement. He appeased the anger of God. Propitiation. Another demand is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That is the greatest commandment. And if we violate that greatest commandment, it follows that we have committed the greatest sin. If loving God is the greatest commandment, not loving God is the greatest sin. And oh, my dear friends, we are all guilty of the sin of not loving God. And the Bible says, He who does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. What does receiving the Lord Jesus Christ mean? It means receiving Christ as the only remedy to our problem of sin. Believing in Christ. Yet to all who believe in Him, even yet to all who receive Him, even to those who believe in Him, to them He gave, he gave the right to become, He gave the right to become children of God. God is the author of our salvation. We cannot save ourselves. That's the clear language of Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. Please turn there. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. And this is really very categorical. Our salvation is not by our own good works. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. It says here, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And of course, the good works that are mentioned in verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is just the fruit of of saving grace this is just the fruit of saving grace god saved us in order to bear good fruit but this is not part of the formula of salvation titus chapter 3 verse 5 
It's very clear. And people get confused about the formula to salvation and the fruit of salvation. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. It says here, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by washing, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So you see, my dear friends, for the wages of sin is death. Now what is our wage? What did we earn? We earned death. That is the only wages fitting for us because we are guilty in the sight of God. And we have to understand, my dear friends, that the author of salvation is God. It is God who gives the grace of saving faith. And He can give it and withhold it and still be a just God. And so receiving Christ means coming to Him as a beggar. Coming to Him as a beggar. We cannot save ourselves. Coming to Him as a beggar and receiving from Him grace which we don't earn or deserve. And what is the fruit of saving grace? What is the fruit of the salvation that we receive from the Lord freely? Jesus did not hang naked and suffer and die on a bloody cross to make you happy, but to make you holy. Now, unfortunately, these prosperity preachers present Jesus as the source of happiness, as the source of joy. They focus on the sentimental, gushy feeling. Jesus Christ did not die on the cross to make you happy, but to make you holy. Jesus did not save you so that you can remain in your filthy sins. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. And you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The true gospel, my dear friends, speaks of a cross in the life of a believer. The true gospel speaks of a cross that we need to carry on a daily basis. We have to pick up and carry that cross as we follow the crucified Savior. What does the Lord Jesus Christ say? If any man will come after me, let him keep his sins and gratify his flesh to his heart's content. As long as he follows me, is that what the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us? No, he did not say that. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's what receiving Christ means. We have to receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. He is not only our Savior, but he is our Lord. And therefore, he is our king. He is our master. We are his slaves. And we have to follow his footstep. Now that is the God-centered gospel as opposed to a man-centered gospel that only presents Jesus Christ as the true source of happiness. Receive him, receive him, and your life will be meaningful and your life will be happy. That's a man-centered gospel. The God-centered gospel, my dear friends, speaks of ruin. We are guilty in the sight of God. We are condemned in the sight of God because of our sin. The true gospel speaks also of redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ. The true gospel speaks of repentance and faith in Him alone and regeneration. That's the God-centered gospel. The God-centered gospel, my dear friends, shows you that you are a lawbreaker and a rebel. And the truth, my dear friends, is that you and I drink sin like it's water or wine. And that we stand under God's wrath unless we are reconciled back to a holy God through the blood of Jesus Christ. 
That's why the Apostle Paul says, I beseech you, I beg you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. It is only through the blood of Jesus Christ that guilty sinners like us are reconciled to God. Now, I have read this somewhere, this particular illustration of the true gospel, God-centered gospel. There was an Englishman who often traveled to Scotland from England to hear great preaching. And I suppose this was in the 1800s. It was in the days of coaches and horses. And it was quite a long journey to travel from central England to Scotland. And when that man arrived, he found a little chapel, a little church. And he went in to rest and hear the word of God. That was in the days of old. What did he find out? The man at the pulpit was preaching out of Isaiah chapter 6 about the glory of God. And this preacher lifted up the majesty of God and the holiness of God and the attributes of God to such a degree that this traveling Englishman saw for the first time, for the first time, my friends, the awful majesty of a holy God. Well, the next day, what happened? He visited another church. And the minister in the pulpit was preaching on the utter gravity of the ruined nature and the deceitfulness of the human heart. And as this man preached, he laid out all the blackness of sin and the darkness and blindness of a poor sinner without Christ. And lastly, my dear friends, this Englishman visited a white-haired preacher who spoke on the loveliness of Jesus Christ. And this preacher drew out in detail such wonderful examples of Christ's appeal through being compared to a treasure in a field and a matchless pearl of great price. In that preaching, Christ was very appealing and very lovely to behold. Now that story, my dear friends, is a vivid portrait of the God-centered gospel. That's what God-centered gospel is all about. First, you are shown the awful majesty of a holy God, high and lifted up who dwells with a cherubim and whose name is holy. That's what the Bible tells us. Next, my dear friends, you are shown your ruined nature and your own deceitful heart. And that's a terrible thing. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Please turn there. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. It describes the heart that is very deceitful above all else. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all else, all things, and desperately sick. Who can understand it? My dear friend, that's a terrible feeling. When you see your heart for what it truly is, and this is my prayer right now, that the Holy Spirit will open your eyes so that you will be able to see your heart for what it truly is. And you see yourself without the props of self-righteousness because our self-righteousness is just filthy rags in the sight of God. May the Holy Spirit open your eyes so that you will see yourself as it truly is without the props of self-righteousness in the sight of God. No self-righteousness holding you up. You see a holy God and your great need of being reconciled back to Him. That's your condition, my dear friend. But how are you going to be reconciled to God? Yes, there is beauty in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Lord and Savior of sinners like us. 
The pearl of great price is shown in all his beauty and loveliness. The Lord Jesus Christ is revealed. Look at the Lord Jesus Christ, my dear friends. How lovely is the Lord, our God. How desirable is the Lord, our God. He received all of the pangs and weight and burden and curse because of our sin. All of our sins, the Lord Jesus Christ carried on his shoulder and he appeased the righteous wrath and indignation of God. That's the true gospel, my dear friends. You are not the author of your salvation. No one is. Only God is the author of your salvation. Only God can give you saving faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And even this faith, that's how we understand the passage. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, what is the this? This faith, even this faith does not come from you. It is the gift of God. Only the Spirit of God can awaken you to your lost condition. And this is my prayer right now, even at this moment, my dear friend. May the Holy Spirit convict you of your sin. Only the Spirit of God can rot upon your heart in a true work of grace through regeneration. That's not within my power to do it. The most that I could do is to bring the word of the gospel to you. But the Holy Spirit should accompany the preaching of the gospel with his power. To be saved, my dear friend, you must exercise repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what receiving Christ means. That's what our passage is talking about. To all who believe him. To all who receive him, rather, even to those who believe in him, he gave the right to become children of God. But then we come to our second point, what is the hindrance to receiving Christ? And there is an article, the, because this is the only hindrance to receiving Christ. It is so sad, my dear friends, that Jesus Christ's kinsmen in the flesh refused to receive him as their Messiah. Despite the countless miracles that he performed before them, they still refused to believe in him. Jesus Christ performed many signs. He uttered doctrines. He showed his tender mercies and compassion. He fulfilled all of the prophecies about the Messiah in the Old Testament, and they are very obvious. But the Jews still refused to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Despite the evidence, they would rather have Barabbas over Jesus. Luke chapter 19, verse 14. Please turn there. This is very sad. Another sad passage of the Bible. Luke chapter 19, verse 14. It says here, But his citizens hated him, and sent a delegation after him saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. And my dear friends, we are all like those Jews. We are all like those Jewish people. We do not want to have Jesus reign over us. It's only by his grace and by his grace alone that we can have a heart that is willing to become subject to the kingship of Christ. Now, what's the hindrance? What's the hindrance to receiving Christ? You know what the hindrance is? Man is dead. Dead in his trespasses and sin. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. An unbeliever, a person who is not yet in the Lord Jesus Christ, is dead in his trespasses and sin. It's not literal physical death he is conscious he is inclined to one particular thing and that is sin he is dead in his sin and no matter how much harder the preacher tries to show the glory of the lord jesus christ to a dead person spiritually 
he will not be able to see the glory of Christ. He will continue to remain in the dark because the, his deeds are evil. John chapter 3 verse 19. John chapter 3 verse 19. People love darkness because their deeds are evil. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. That's the hindrance to receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what is the remedy? Jesus Christ clearly tells us in John chapter 3 verse 3, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, to be born again means to be born from above, not born from below. What is being born from below? Born physically from the mother's womb. And even if you are born over and over again from your mother's womb from below, you will never be able to see the kingdom of God. Because to be born of the flesh, to be born of the woman, means... To be born under the curse of Adam, under the imputed sin of Adam, under the sinful nature of Adam, you must be born from above. And that is not within our power to do so. The Holy Spirit gives life. That's why in verse 5 it tells us, unless you are born of water and of spirit, you cannot see, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. To be born of the Spirit means to be quickened by the Holy Spirit. Are you threatened because of your sin, my dear friends? Are you alarmed? Come to Jesus Christ that you may have life. Do not come to the pastor, although the pastor is instrumental in proclaiming the gospel to you. But we are not the source of life. Come to Christ right now. Receive Him. That means believe in Him as your only Lord and Savior. And that brings us to our third point, the consequence of receiving Christ. And what does John chapter 1 verse 12 tell us? It says here, But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right or the authority to become children of God. But pastor, aren't all people God's children? Didn't God create all of us and therefore we are God's children? Well, in a sense, that's true. According to the creative power of God, we are God's children by virtue of creation. But we, what we are talking here is God's spiritual children. John chapter 8, verse 44. Majority of the people in the world are not God's children. And if they are not God's children, whose children are they? John chapter 8, verse 44. I mean, all of us were created by God. But not all of us are given the right or the authority to become children of God. John chapter 8, verse 44. What does the Lord say here? He says, You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And majority of the people in this world are children of Satan. Now, if you believe in Christ, and you can never believe in Christ unless he quickens your dead soul. If you believe in Christ, the consequence is that you are given the right to become children of God. But in order for us not to boast about our act of believing in Christ or receiving in him, there is a clear qualification in verse 13 of our text it says here in verse 13 who are who were born not of blood 
nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So it's not our free will that determined our salvation. Because in reality, we are not neutral beings. We are being sinful beings inclined towards sin. Yes, we have the freedom to do whatever we want. But what do we want? We want to sin. We are not neutral actually. We are born with a basic inclination to sin. Now, if you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, if you believe in Him, repenting of your sin and taking Him, embracing Him as your Lord and Savior, we know that it is not the will of man who were born not of the flesh nor of the will of man nor of the power of the flesh but of the will of God. And so the glory belongs to Christ alone. The gospel calls you to respond, yes. But can you respond without the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit? John chapter 6 verse 37. John chapter 6 verse 37. There is a wonderful promise, my dear friends. There is a wonderful promise that if you will come to Jesus Christ, He will never cast you out. And we say hallelujah to that. But why do you come to Christ in the first place? The answer is given in verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Why do you come to Christ? Because you have been predestined by the Father even before the foundation of the world. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And verse 44 of that chapter, John 6, 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Verse 65, it says here, and he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. The truth is, we cannot boast of our salvation. From start to finish, salvation is of God. It is the work of God. But you have to repent because that is the call of the gospel. Repent of your sin and believe in Jesus Christ. But even repentance and faith, are gifts of God. Now, my dear friends, may the Holy Spirit indeed have opened your hearts today, causing you to see the blackness of your heart, causing you to see your condemned status before God. And may your eyes be opened also so that you will be able to behold the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. How lovely is the Lord Jesus Christ who left his glories in heaven and came down to earth. He lived a perfect life. He became subject to the law. And in the course of time, he offered his blood at the cross of Calvary as a ransom, as a propitiation. And if you believe in him, all of your sins will be forgiven, past, present, and future. Come to Jesus Christ right now. Do not delay. He will save you. He will save you. And of course, He will give you the right to become God's children. But as many, God's child rather, but as many as received Him, to them He gave the power to become children of God, even to those who believe in Him. Let us pray. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the wonderful gift of adoption. We used to be children of Satan. We used to be your enemies, O oh God, but through Jesus Christ, we have been adopted to your family. And thank you for the undiluted gospel message that has just been proclaimed tonight. We pray that you will grant this broadcast a far-reaching effect, that people from all corners of the world will be able to listen to it, and that by listening to the gospel proclamation, you will wrought repentance and faith in their hearts and cause them to humble themselves before you to run to Jesus Christ and be saved. And this we pray in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.